want to take the risk of talking to you about a very obscure television show most of you probably haven't heard of. It's called Game of Thrones. <laughs> How many of you in all seriousness have seen none or very few episodes of Game of Thrones? That's what I, th I thought that might actually be the case, as popular as it is. Um, so it is, as you may have heard, returning for a final season. So I will tell you just a slightest bit about it, because um, for the uninitiated. Uh, the, the title refers to political machinations, that's the game between various noble houses and a medieval-like world competing to seat on this, sit on this fabled iron throne and rule the continent of Westeros where they find themselves. But in the world of the show, and the reason I think it's significant for the sporting is that as important as that Game of Thrones can seem, there actually are larger concerns. Each of the fictional noble houses in this show has house words, a motto that speaks uh, describes their core commitments as a family. And many of the series' central characters, they come from House Stark, whose house words point to larger concerns beyond the Iron Throne, embodied in what is perhaps the show's most famous lines, Winter is, is coming, coming, right? Without getting into more nerdy details or any spoilers, in the world of Game of Thrones, the coming winter will not be ordinary. It will be a long night, an existential threat to all of humanity, no matter who sits on the Iron Throne or in the White House. Uh, so one lesson from this blockbuster television show is that winning the Game of Thrones, the presidency, the Houses of Congress, the control of the Supreme Court, in the short term can actually be an exercise in missing the point. You, your house, your tribe may be in power for now, but winter is coming. Or should we say climate change is coming, whether you like it or not. As Philip K. Dick used to say, reality it's what doesn't go away even when you stop believing in it. <laughs> the overwhelming scientific consensus is that climate change is coming and has already started, whether climate change deniers believe it or not. Reality doesn't care about whether you believe in it. For anyone wondering if I'm reading too much into the parallels between our current political situation and this fictional series, consider that Less than a year ago, in the interview with the New York Times, uh, series author George R. R. Martin explicitly affirmed that his series can be read in a broad sense as a parable about climate change. So, Joe, I would say just turn it. Can you turn it down just a little bit? It's a little loud for y'all. Are you all right? Yeah. I think turn the volume down a little bit. I know. Okay. okay. But in the meantime, turn it down a little bit in here. Okay. So, like, okay. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so, George R. Martin has explicitly affirmed that his series can be read in a broad sense as a parable about climate change. In his words, the people of Westeros are fighting their individual battles over power and status and wealth. And those are so distracting them that they're ignoring the threat that winter is coming, which has the potential to destroy all of them and to destroy their world. And there's a great parallel there too, I think, what I see our planet doing here, uh, Martin says, where we're fighting our own battles, all these things, and they're important issues, but none of them are important if like, I don't know, we're dead and our cities are under the ocean. So really climate change, he concludes, should be the number one priority for any politician who is capable of looking past just the next election. Martin is right in many ways, although I'm glad to stipulate that part of what holds us back from passing the same climate change legislation is white supremacy, male supremacy, classism, and more. So dismantling those systems of oppression is an integral part of what must be done. Indeed, the interconnectedness of systems of oppression is precisely the focus of our congregational conversation next Sunday here in the sanctuary during the middle hour between the two services. We'll be discussing this year's UUA Common Read, which is the one book selected each year that all you use. It's like, if I could recommend one book to all you use to read and discuss and act on, the book chosen this year is Justice for the Earth, People of Faith Working at the Intersection of Race, 
and class and the environment, that we need to be doing all those together. If you have time to read some or all of the book next Sunday, great, uh, but please do come, you're welcome, whether or not you've read all or any of the book. For now, to continue our focus on climate change, the most compelling book I've read recently is uh, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warning. Have any of you read that or just heard any interviews with Wallace Wells, who's the author? Okay. Uh, he's been making the circuit. It was published just two months ago. It's a quick read, but it's quite powerful. It's arresting from the first sentence in which, sentence in which he says clearly, it's worse, much worse than you think. Now, I know some of you are deeply immersed in climate science, but we can at least adjust that sentence to say it's worse, much worse than most people think. Maybe it's exactly as bad as you think. Uh, and the core of Wallace Wells' book is um, a 12-chapter middle section on the elements of chaos that climate change will cause around heat death, hunger, drowning, wildfires, enhanced natural disasters, freshwater drain, dying oceans, unbreathable air, plagues of warming, economic collapse, climate conflict, and systemic shifts. At the conclusion of that section, he says, if you have made it this far, you are a brave reader. Any one of these 12 chapters contains by rights enough horror to induce a panic attack in even the most optimistic of those considering it. But you are not merely considering it, you are about to embark on living it, whether you want to or not, whether you believe it or not. He says, in many cases, in many places, we already are living it. I don't enjoy being the harbinger of bad news, but as a species, we're just not listening to the warnings of our best scientists. The sad truth is the opposite. More than half of the carbon exha exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels has been done in just the past three decades. Which means we've done as much damage to the fate of our planet, that blue boat home that we sang about earlier, we've done, uh, and its abilities to sustain life and human um, civilization, we've done as much damage since Al Gore published his first book on climate than in all the centuries and all the millennia that came before. That's an even more inconvenient truth than Vice President Gore initially presented. What I've personally found most frightening to date is the extent to which we are witnessing so-called 500-year storms, 500-year floods, pretty frequently, right, with increasing frequency. One interesting angle of the Wallace Wells book is that he does not write about climate change from the common perspective of a scientist or an environmentalist or a nature lover. Personally, as a nature lover who grew up spending hours in the woods, as a vegetarian for more than two decades, an occasional vegan, I'm pretty easily persuadable to calls to simplify your lifestyle and reconnect to nature. In contrast, Wallace Wells freely admits, I've lived my whole life in cities, enjoying gadgets built by industrial supply chains I hardly think twice about. I've never gone camping. And while I uh, think, thought it was basically a good idea to keep streams clean and air clean, I also always accepted the proposition that there was a trade-off between economic growth and the cost of nature. And figured, well, in most cases, I'd probably go for growth, he says. He adds, I'm not about to personally slaughter a cow and eat a hamburger, but I'm also not personally about to go vegan, he confesses. Now, there's a little fake meat movement. We can talk about that if we... Anybody had an impossible burger? All right, what do you think? Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. All right. A lot better than the Boca Burgers of, of ages past. Um, nevertheless, the more he learned about climate change, the more Wallace Wells became convinced that change was needed and fast. And I want to use this example of Wallace Wells, this city and technology loving journalist who has become this fierce advocate for climate change, as a bridge for reflecting on the various ways we might move forward as a species. Two of the archetypal options in the U.S. are sometimes symbolized in Jefferson and Hamilton. Jeffersonian views celebrate the rural over the urban, uh, husbandry over industry, intense local connection over mobile liberty, uh, thrifty independence over opulence and commerce. Considered in isolation, this agrarian ideal championed by Jefferson and embodied today in figures like Wendell Berry, can seem to be the best answer, and there's a lot to admire therein. 
I understand the appeal, but I invite you to consider that that option was much more viable back when our country was founded and there were approximately one billion people on this planet instead of today when we have septupled the human population in two centuries from one billion to 7.6 billion and literally climbing by the second if you watch the popular you know, on our way to probably 10 billion and we might stop there. Depends on who you believe. So let's also get on the table the Hamiltonian worldview, which favored big cities from the beginning, which are said to use less resources than spread out communities, uh, increasing productivity in these big cities because fewer people are directly working with the land, maximizing the output per person, and growing more prosperous because affluence, it is said, makes societies better able to clean up environmental mishaps. To update this typology for modern times, I found helpful Charles Mann's book, The Wizard and the Prophet. Some of you may know his earlier book, 1491. In his latest book, he uses the 20th century scientists uh, Norman Borlaug, the titular wizard, and William Voke, the titular prophet, as representative examples of how to confront the environmental crisis we're facing. Vogue is this classic prophet who's warning that our current prosperity as a species is finite because it is based on taking more from the earth than is sustainable long term. His basic message is cut back, cut back, otherwise we'll all lose. Borlaug, in contrast, is a wizard who trusts that currently unforeseen technological innovations will save us. I worry that who's going to be saved is just the rich. Separate sermon, kind of. His mantra is innovate, innovate. Only that way will everyone win. Or maybe at least the elite few will win. At least in the short term, Borlaug's techno optimist worldview has prevailed. 20th century environmental prophets, um, like you can think of Paul Ehrlich, if any of you read like the population bomb back in the day. Uh, you know, predicted that the world population was growing so fast that it would soon exceed the capacity of food production. Is this Neo Thomas Malthus, who was arguing the same thing in the 1700s, uh, and would cause mass famine. But Borlaug was a major contributor to why that didn't happen, which is the Green Revolution in agriculture. That's why we actually have lowered um, poverty, even as there's still 10% of 7.6 billion people who go hungry every day. That's still terrible, but it was supposed to be you know, 80%. Uh, before we too quickly award any permanent victories, though, to the techno wizards, environmental prophets like Vogue warn that Borlaug and we humans along with him have achieved at most a pyrrhic victory, winning at such a high cost that it might as well be defeat. From the prophet's perspective, yes, the technological revolution in agriculture has prevented mass starvation for now. But in so doing, it has allowed the world population to skyrocket, again, to 7.6 billion people, climbing by the second. These increased numbers make it all the more difficult to reach a sustainable future in which people can live a dignified life and sustain the planet. From a prophetic perspective, technological innovations that further exploit the land and further increase the human population, they are like fighting arson with gasoline. Personally, I do find some value in both perspectives to respond to climate change. I suspect we will need to do both, to heed the prophetic call to cut back and live more simply, and to invest in technological wizardry to try to curb some of climate change's worse effects. Consider that if the average American were confined by the carbon footprint of our European counterparts, U.S. carbon emissions would fall by half just by living an average European lifestyle, which is not so shabby, instead of the average American lifestyle. If the world's richest 10% were limited to that same um, Euro average European footprint, global emissions would fall by a third. But we'll never achieve that um, level, and it's, it gets into what I've, you've heard me say before, the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. Profits still end there, but you tie profits to what's sustainable for the planet and what's humane for people. People, planet, profit. But we'll never achieve cutting by half or a third um, if, if we just result, you know, rely on individual choice and individual conscience. We'll need collective action along something very much akin to what's being called a Green New Deal. We need to invest in renewable energy, public services, public education, and green jobs. 
We need to stop building pipelines and throwing fuel on the fire. We are globally subsidizing the, the fossil fuel industry at the rate of $5 trillion a year. That is utter madness. And I think we're, we're already seeing, and I think we will see ever more clearly, the parallels between the fossil fuel industry today and the lies they are telling and what we've come to see about the tobacco industry. They're just such strong parallels. It's also important to name some change, that some changes matter more than others. One of the easiest changes to make that also, we should be honest, has the smallest impacts is upgrading your light bulbs to a more environmentally friendly model. We've been doing that here at UUCF. We've almost changed all the lights in the building. It's a change many of us has done. It's a good thing to do, though I see that there's talk of having the government take back some of those regulations, which again is, is madness. Uh, it's a good thing to do, but it barely scratches the surface of what needs to be done. So do that, but we need to do a lot more. <laughs> to level up, changes that have a medium level impact um, comparatively are replacing a gasoline-fueled car with a hybrid, washing clothes in cold water instead of hot, recycling, that's a whole separate topic to talk about as well and how we design stuff from the beginning, um, drying your clothes on a clothesline or hanger instead of an electric dryer, but all of that is, again, medium-level differences. If you really want to start making a difference with your lifestyle choices or with what we legislate that people must do um, in ascending order of environmental friendliness and difficulty for many of us, are switching to a plant-based diet, buying green energy, avoiding one transatlantic flight that does a huge amount of carbon emissions, um, living car-free, and having one fewer child. If you're interested in how you could get more involved locally, options include the Climate Change Working Group here at UUCF, the Multi-Faith Alliance of Climate Stewards, which is a network between this and other local congregations, the UU Legislative Ministry, which is acting at the state level, UU's for Social Justice in the Capital Region, acting at the federal level. All of those are, have, um, are focusing on climate change. Uh, Sierra Club, another example of an organization you could work with. Also talk of renewed focus on ways we at UCF can strengthen our Green Sanctuary commitments. If you're interested in further information about any of those, please let me know. I'll be glad to connect you. For now, as we reflect on how we feel called, both individually and collectively, to be part of a movement, a global movement for climate justice, I'd like to invite us to continue that reflection as we prepare um, to participate in our annual UU ritual, uh, Flower Community. It's most appropriate that our flower communion this year is in Earth Month uh, because, as the climate activist Bill McKibben has said, I don't think it's appropriate uh, for little kids to be only freaking out about climate change. He says, it's always struck me as a parent that my first job in this context was to help my daughter fall in love with the Earth and with the natural world. And if you do that, then I'm absolutely confident that our children will do what is necessary to protect it. The beauty of spring is a powerful reminder of how vital our environmental justice work is because this planet is so astoundingly beautiful in its diversity. The practice of flower communion also reminds us of the importance and risk of working for justice. Flower communion originated in 1921 in a Unitarian congregation in Prague, which at the time was located in the capital city of Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic. Under the leadership of its minister, Norbert Chopik, it grew into the largest Unitarian congregation in the world at that time. It had a membership in 1932 of more than 3,000. In 1941, Chopik was arrested by the Nazis on charges of treason. A year later, he was executed in Dachau, the concentration camp. Chopik was martyred for supporting individual liberty in the face of fascism. And the continuation of flower communion today affirms the intent of his original ritual that as no two flowers that you see before us this morning are alike, so too no people are alike. No two people are alike, yet each has a contribution to make. Together, these different flowers form this beautiful bouquet. And our common bouquet here at UCF would not be the same without the unique addition of each of you. Thus it is with our beloved community. We are lessened when any of us are absent. In a few moments, we'll sing together hymn number 305 in your great hymnal, De Caloris. As we sing, you may remain seated, but once we start singing, I invite you to come forward row by row. You'll see like those kind of on this half of the curtain, you can come over here, 
those on this half can come up on this side. We'll start at the front, move toward the back, and don't be shy. Once we start singing, go ahead and start um, coming forward. Uh, each individual is invited to take a flower that is different from the one you brought. Select a flower that particularly appeals to you, and as you take your chosen flower, note its unique shape and beauty. If you didn't bring a flower, feel free to come forward and take a flower anyway. Some bought bouquets, so you would have extra. Next year, you can bring a bouquet if you uh, So uh, we'll continue singing De Caloris until everyone has come forward, including the Spanish verse, which we'll sing as the equivalent of verse 4. There are also the Joys and Sorrows rocks. You're welcome to drop a rock into the water as you come forward to get a flower. So on this Sunday of focus on climate justice, I invite you as we practice flower communion to continue discerning how do you individually, how do we collectively feel called to play a role in ensuring the continued blooming of abundant, diverse life on this fragile planet.